Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. I'm Shane Moss here with my return guest, Sarah Hill, who is out with her new book, This Is Your Brain on Birth Control. Welcome back, Sarah. Thanks, Shane. I'm glad to be back. What are you doing in... Are you just visiting LA right now? Because you are the last time we talked. You you did my show in Dallas, right? Yeah, no, that and that's normally last... that's normally where I am. I'm doing preemptive traveling for the holidays so I can quarantine before I see people. Ah, that's very smart. Yeah. Everyone during uh, is like doing... Uh, bubbling up and getting ready and testing and that sort of thing for for Thanksgiving that's that's uh that's wonderful well (laughs) you know it's like it's one of those things where um you have to sort of figure out what's the best risk minimizing behaviors that you can do given like your need for mental health and social connection for sure and um and so this is like where I landed yeah um come come early stay away and then (laughs) gather (laughs) <laughs> Although, um, family gatherings for our mental health. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I was just like, I'm, I'm just like, it's like the handicap principle, right? It's like, I'm like trying to like show like my mental health is so robust. robust. Look at the can... hurdles that I can intentionally <laughs> exactly. put myself Right. It's like, not only can I live through a pandemic, but I can hang out with my family. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it is. Um, so I'm really fit as you can tell. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> my mental, my mental health is super Perfect. When did you, your book just came out last year, right? It did. It was last October. Awesome. Uh, I see it's been making a lot of like wonderful lists and stuff, and I keep on seeing it pop up. Well, I follow you, so that helps. Yeah. But, I, but yeah. I have also seen other people reference your book as well. I have a. Before we get all <laughs> into birth control, I had this thought the other day. I feel like of my guests, you'd be a good person to run it by. This isn't an uncommon thought for me to have, but uh, I mean, you have two kids. I have zero kids. It's probably going to stay that way. I, you're you're set with two. I think I'm I'm done at zero. Uh, uh, in your opinion, um, are kids weird? Like, is it a weird thing? <laughs> to, yeah. To do. Yeah, no kids are weird. Right? <laughs> it's like the only thing and, and, and expensive and, and, and a real pain in the ass. And so it's like the only thing that could possibly overcome all of those hurdles to making people want to, um, you know, have them is a Darwinian imperative. Yeah, <laughs> that's like, that's like the only thing that that promotes um, that promotes uh, the continued having of children. Because yeah, it's like expensive and, and, and I mean, let's just be honest for a really long, like my, so mine are teenagers now yeah. or like emerging into the, and, and there's so much more interesting, but like uh, for yeah. a really long time, they were really boring. <laughs> <laughs> so like to finally get them at an age where we can like talk about interesting things and they can be funny. Yeah. Um, they're like worth hanging out with. Like I actually enjoy <laughs> hanging out with them. Um, that wasn't always the case. <laughs> that, that's, I, I, I see this very like cinematic, beautiful moment between you and your, your children. <laughs> like, you know, now that you're 15, I can kind of enjoy hanging out with yeah, you. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's like doing all that crap with the Itsy Bitsy Spider and, you know, and Play-Doh. Like... <laughs> <laughs> See, I kind of like that stuff. Actually, I used to always tell people, oh, I like kids, and I'm really good with kids, and now I think, hmm, I need to be more specific than that. <laughs> I I like right. some kids. I was right. always the babysitter growing up, and I liked doing that, um, all my little cousins and stuff. But yeah, I like my friends' kids and stuff like that, but, but usually like 15 minutes, I'm like, all right. Yeah, I like um, I'm good. Okay. Um, yeah, I, kids are cause, weird. Because I was thinking about uh, uh, the last little thing, and I swear we'll get into your book. Uh, I was thinking about how 
uh, uh people putting things on instagram and every especially with the pandemic uh, going on right now every time someone has like a big announcement i'm like oh okay uh, <laughs> right. but, but but there's this there's this social pressure to like celebrate and hooray and, the, and then i was thinking about how how parents are always like boy i never I never knew how selfless I could be until I had a kid. It's like, it's you. It's a little you. It's your genetic. Right, yeah. Like, like if you're adopting, sure, you, you got me there. But if right. it was, <laughs> like if I had a, if like if I cloned myself and I like had a baby <laughs> and someone came up to me in a park, like who's the mother? I was like, oh, it's me. That's just a clone of right. me. <laughs> People would be like, what is wrong with you? Like, well, I never... I never, I never realized I how selfless I could possibly <laughs> yes. be until I started raising myself that like I also of... named Shane. Yeah. The depth of my ability to care for another human, right? But, you know, it's really funny because it'd be really interesting to see, like, um, narcissism and parenthood, right? So, like, are narcissists actually, like, even more into their kids, even more selfless, than non-narcissists, That right? would be really interesting to find mm -hmm. out. Surely they are, right? Wow, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, I just had a narcissism episode. Oh, let's get into it. Uh, that, yeah. That's, uh, that, that would be a wonderful study to see. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, em I'm going to connect you with my narcissism researcher that I just had on recently. <laughs> awesome. So let's, uh, let's talk about your, your book. What's it all about? Um, uh, this is, uh, I mean, we, I don't, when was, when did I first have you on here for was, uh, this, uh, like three, three years, years ago? ago? Yeah, that yeah. seems about right. Um, so let's just assume, because I don't even remember the conversation, I'm sure we generally talked about some of this stuff. Um, but, uh, but why don't you just give everyone a overview of your, of your work and also listeners sure. go back and listen to the first one as well. As my memory serves me, it was it was good. It was fabulous. It was like I think it was the best episode that you've had to date. <laughs> um, no, so the the book is about um, this is your brain on birth control. So it's um, as you might expect, it's about the way that the birth control pill influences um, women's uh, sort of their brains and then you know their behavior and so then their experiences of the world and. Um, you know, the book just sort of starts out with an overview of the way that women's sex hormones influence women's brains, um, and then what the birth control pill does to women's sex hormones, and then what the research shows about the way that that um, sort of influences the way that women experience the world. Um, and I wrote the book uh, because um, I think that we have a blind spot um, when it comes to hormonal contraceptives. Um, like, I... Uh, and it was a it was a blind spot that I noticed myself when um, I, so I had spent my career um, studying motivation and um, and behavior and especially in women and I'd even published some papers on the way that women's sex hormones um, as they change across the cycle change women's you know motivation and and the way that they behave and so I was doing all of this work and so I was like I've, I've always understood the role of hormones and brains and and behavior. Um, but I was on hormonal contraceptives the entire time I was doing this work and never thought about the way that they influence anything that was going on, like from the waist down, you know, I just would, was like, oh, well, it's, you know, I'm not getting pregnant. And so that's amazing. But I, it never, I never connected the dots, which is like really embarrassing. Um, I, I when, eat a lot of candy while like reading about like obesity rates and right? like mismatches <laughs> of our, uh, of our uh, uh, fondness of sugar in our modern <laughs> environment. So right, and you're I like stupid fuckers, the stupid <laughs> <fat> fuckers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it's um. So I, I really, I never connected the dots until I actually I went off of hormonal contraceptives um altogether after I was on them for over ten years. Um, I just going off them off and on to have my kids, and um, and it felt I felt really different. I just like I felt like I woke up. Um, and uh, and so I became really interested in you know, okay, like, was this just me who feels really different when I'm off of the pill? Um, or does the research support that this is something that happens sort of a, a lot of times in women? And, um, 
you know, and of course, when I went to the literature and started reviewing this stuff, of, of course, the research shows that hormonal contraceptives influence the brain and influence behavior because that's what hormones do. And, um, yeah. and there's like no way for them not to, it's like magical thinking to think that you can take a hormone and have it affect one part of your body and not the other, you know? And, uh, anyway, so, um, I wrote the book to like sort of educate, uh, uh, women mostly, but also men just like, Hey, um, here's how hormones work. Um, and here's what we know about sex hormones in the brain, especially with women. Um, and, and here's uh, how you can manipulate that to get laid more. Is that what yeah. you were going for? With that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, so, you know, it's like trying to, um, yeah, just like put all the pieces of all that together for people. So that way, um, the information will be out there. Cause you know, doctors don't, um, talk about this stuff to their patients. They, they just talk about risk of stroke and heart problems or whatever, but they don't talk about the psychological effects. That is strange that uh, I, I to this day you you think that most doctors still don't do that that is the troubling thing that that uh, the kind of um assumption is like is that like oh i take this pill and what it does is it makes it so that i don't get pregnant and then you just right. think about like that one very specific which is awesome like if that's yeah. all that it did that's what we're yes. aiming for um yes. but but all of the other uh all of the other implications um yeah and it, it is still true so i mean so now you know there are many doctors offices that will talk about the possibility of um you know what they call a mood related side effects hmm. so that it, that it might um you know in some women cause problems with mood and they also will sometimes discuss with their patients that it could be associated with changes in uh, libido and sexual functioning, um, but that's about as far as it ever goes, you know. And and, and that's not even all doctors' offices. Um, do, do you do you think a little bit of that is also that just like talking about like the idea of obviously there's plenty of female doctors, but the idea of a male doctor like mansplaining women's like moodiness right. on, on the, do, you, right. do you think that there's like a little bit of just like general uncomfortability with that too of not wanting to like perpetuate the hey just so you know this might make you a little -hoo -hoo. <laughs> like, yeah it might make you a little coo yeah <laughs> no i think that there's probably an element of that but I, I really think that the biggest issue and i don't think that this is unique to birth control and i don't think that it's um you know, and I don't think that it's like the fault of individual doctors, but I think there's this like artificial disconnect um, that still exists in medicine where um, they still believe in the like mind body Cartesian split where yeah. when you go into the doctor's office, they'll talk about all the ways that a medication is going to influence everything outside of your brain. Right. Because as far as they're concerned, that research belongs in a different and, and it does it actually that research gets published in totally different journals that aren't read by physicians. Right, so physicians are reading about how does this medication influence the heart valve or, you know, the risk of stroke or um, LDL cholesterol levels, but they don't read about how does this influence the brain? How does this influence the way that people experience the world? And like, it's coming out now that more, you know, like not only with the hormonal medications, where obviously you're going to get big experiential um, differences, you know, just in changes in the brain. Um, but even now it's coming out like things like um, uh, uh, antihistamines can have psychological side effects. Really? And um, yeah, well, it's, mm. you know, uh, our brain is like an organ in the body. And, mm. um, and so when you make changes to different systems, um, because a lot of those systems are systems that communicate with the brain, it's going to change the way that we feel. And it's going to change the way we experience the world. And it might even exchange, you know, and it, it can um, like influence like what we do and so um i, I think that we need to, like science uh, like like uh, neuroscience and and you know and, and even you know just like psychology broadly and medicine need to communicate i mean it's like it's like science you know uh, neuroscience and psychology is over here and 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 you know medicine is over here and and so the doctors have no idea the, the way like even things like um inflammation influence the brain and how people feel and so like if somebody is sick they're probably going to have a whole bunch of psychological side effects that go along with that and doctors don't really 
they're not educated on any of that. And so they don't talk to their patients about it. I, I think that there, I mean, there might even be like a little bit of an evolutionary bias of uh, uh, like the human, the human brain is quite fond of itself. Like yes. e even you calling it an <laughs> organ, my brain's like, well, not just some other organ, <laughs> the, the very best of the organs, of course. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, everything from as as someone who's been exercising regularly lately one of the benefits of being off the road for the first time in 15 years um man that it really uh it is a dramatic change for my mental health and and Good. everything else yeah. yeah, well, all of that is, um, you know, as your bodily states change, it totally changes your mental landscape. And um, and so the idea that um, medicine, as it's mostly practiced, is like totally devoid of, of even thinking about the conversations between the brain and the rest of the body is, um, yeah, sort of limited. And so a lot of the conversations about the way that um, drugs that we might take might make us feel, um, you know, they're not being had at the doctor's office. All right. Well, f before we get into the rest, I just don't want to I don't want to end up I know before we really get into the meat of it, I might get lost and I only have you for so long and I don't want to forget to ask you about or I I want to talk just a little bit about my testicles if we could. Uh okay. one <laughs> um what's going on with male birth control these days? Mm -hmm. And two, I had this thought so I've always wanted to get a vasectomy. One of the things that I'm most embarrassed about myself is like, I I think of myself as having like a high pain threshold and not being scared of things. And there's just something about this incredibly simple procedure that like really messes with my head. <laughs> For like 10 years now, I've been meaning to get a vasectomy. Um, and I always thought, well... What if I change my mind eventually, and do I maybe I store my sperm in a sperm bank? I, I'm I I've I'm told that that can be like iffy. Um, it, I don't know. It, yeah, if, I don't know about if, that. If if if, uh, if it's like bad for sperm over time, if it degrades or whatever, I have no idea. And then yeah. I was also wondering if you get a vasectomy and then you get it reverse. Do things go back to normal? And if so, couldn't you get one and then get it reversed when you need to, like every four years or whatever, and then get things right. going again and then That's get really a vasectomy again? Yeah, I think that like doing too many vasectomies, because like, so the way that that usually, <laughs> right, because you're, you're severing the vas deferens tube, right, which is like the little tube that connects the sperm to everything else that mixes up with ejaculate and it gives you the whole package and so like you sever this tube and so then your body is still producing sperm but they're just like floating off into outer space because yeah. they're not actually making it down into the ejaculate right right and so like when they're reassembling it like i think they have to like caught like almost like i'm thinking about it, like a welder like cauterize like cauterize yeah. the little tube and put it and i don't know like and so i don't know if they're always a hundred percent and trying to put it back together, you know, because I would imagine if you're like taking something apart and then like trying to solder it together again. And it's like the fourth time you go in, they're going to look at you a little weird. Too. Like, is yeah. this guy addicted to vasectomies? What is going on? <laughs> it's like, just shut up and do your job. <laughs> <laughs> so, because I, because I, and, and we'll, we'll get into the pros and cons of female birth control, but I, my, my limited knowledge already is that. I, if I could instead have it be me, that would that seems like it would be the uh, the the better way to go. Um, right. And, right. But but is there has there been uh, actual male birth control pills? Well, so they they tried to um, they had some uh, they were up for clinical trial where they have created something and it works sort of similarly to um, the way that. Uh, female birth control works, except in this case, it keeps sperm count so low that um, men can't, you know, inseminate their partner. Um, but uh, so the men, they had, oh, gosh, I don't even know how long they had them doing it, but they had them on a, a clinical trial, supposed to be something like a six month clinical trial. It, it shut down in like 
two weeks because the men were complaining about the side effects um, being so intolerable. <laughs> and, um, and the side effects are very similar to the types of side effects that women get really? on their hormonal birth control. Yeah, yeah. And, but I mean, you know, honestly, um, like I love the idea of a male contraceptive, like a male hormonal contraceptive. Like I, I love it because obviously, you know, women were the ones who were, tend to be, or historically we've been the ones bearing the cost of, um, of contraception and, um, it'd be nice to have some male participation in that. Yeah. But, um, I mean, that's just like shifting the problem of, you know, changing somebody's like a, a, a person's entire hormonal profile, um, from you just shifting the problem from women to men. And, um, and with, with men, like, I, I think that it's sort of problematic because, um, it, it works in the context of a long-term relationship right in a long-term relationship and my partner tells me i'm on the male birth control pill like i know that i can trust that right <laughs> you know uh, but like if i'm out and meet some dude right and we're gonna yeah. and he's like i'm on the male birth control pill it's gonna be like yeah i don't care i need to like <laughs> we're yeah, gonna need yeah. reinforcements because for women i mean it's like we're the ones who bear the cost of an undesired pregnancy um, and so, you know, I, I just don't know that women will ever feel comfortable relinquishing the, the certainty of contraception to uh, uh, their partners. I mean, and even with a long-term partner, it's like, you know, most <laughs> guys most aren't women, the most conscientious. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Of and the again, genders. And they, we would expect that they wouldn't be as motivated to remember to take it at the right time every day and everything the way that women oh, are because because they're not bearing the cost. I mean, because it's like the cost to them is like, well, you know, accidentally got my partner pregnant. Um, oops, but that's like less than, um, of course, if you're the female on the business end of that unwanted pregnancy. So I don't know that we're ever going to be able to um, find, you know, a, a, a sort of hormonal contraception for men that would be something that was readily um, adopted. And, and and let me just add that, that the, what they're coming up with for this is ridiculous. Like um, the, the most recent one that they were testing was this gel and it lowers men's test, <laughs> lowers men's testosterone to such a degree that they're no longer producing enough sperm to inseminate somebody. Like, <laughs> can you imagine like what man is going to take that? Like, do you know any men who would voluntarily like, Give me the thing that lowers my T so much, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, no, um, we can't even like, there's a testosterone clinic on like every There's some every guys corner. I would prescribe it to, but I, I yeah, wouldn't exactly. take it myself. <laughs> exactly. And, 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 and those guys, usually the testosterone is their favorite thing about themselves. So it's right. No. Position. And so, yeah. So Shane's like, let me give you a back rub with the special gel. <laughs> I, gel. I I I wonder if they're going to make headway on the condom department. It would be nice to have better feeling condoms <laughs> eventually. Yeah. That would solve a lot of issues, but oh, yes. I don't know how that's possible. They keep no. on they're like ribs, more ribs, less ribs. We don't, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we don't know. <laughs> um so uh, before we get into your minor birth control, I, I think that uh, it, it, you probably have the caveat of obviously uh, both of us are very much into people having kids when they want kids and yes. limiting having unwanted children. We're both yes. very much for that and uh, especially in the I know in the intro of your book, you you mentioned the you, you know you're a very accomplished uh, woman, and and uh, perhaps uh, that would have been much more difficult without the birth control pill. Yeah, yeah, no. The whole idea behind the book isn't that birth control is bad and that women shouldn't take it, or that that you know, um, and that is always bad for women in all contexts. Because I don't believe that to be true at all. Um, instead, it's just about providing women with all of the information about the trade-offs that they're making when they're on it, 
So that way they're able to make the most informed choices possible about their health and wellness. And so um, it's just really about like, hey, here's the information that you didn't get at the doctor's office about the way that the birth control pill can influence um, the way that you experience the world. Um, And then you can use that information to make the choice about whether or not it's the right trade off to make. Because I mean, in knowing everything that I know now, um, you know, especially like early on in my college career, um, like knowing all that I know and the trade-offs I was making, I would still go on it um, because it's not dangerous. And, um, you know, and it really is um, a game changer in terms of um, allowing women to be able to achieve their educational goals and, you know, financial um, independence and all these other things um, because they can be certain, you know, all but absolutely certain that they're not going to get pregnant from sex. And, um, and that's really a game changer in terms of, um, allowing women to feel confident that, you know, I can start a PhD program. So I'm going to be able to finish it without getting accidentally pregnant and getting benched, you know, for whatever, and not ever finishing, or I can get my college degree because if I started, I'll be able to finish it. because I'm not going to accidentally end up pregnant. And just the way that like taking that, taking pregnancy out of the picture changes the motivational landscape for women. I mean, in terms of long-term goals. And so um, it is really something that is really important to women. And I'd still make that choice knowing everything I know now, but I still think that it's really important that women understand um, what the trade-offs are. So that way they can actually make choices for themselves instead of just taking something, wondering why they're feeling weird and not having an explanation for it. Mm. And that's what we've kind of been stuck with up until now. And um, as as a species that some people would argue is potentially driving themselves toward the sixth great mass extinction, um, <laughs> it's it's, uh, it's something to consider. It, it, it and it seems like as um, uh, at least from the the research that I've seen as. Uh, as, as societies tend to progress, people usually do opt to delay uh, having children and and um, and going to continued ed- education and, and focusing on their careers more for longer before having their uh, their first children. So not only is it slowing the population increase, but also potentially increasing the quality of um, the ability to, for parents to provide resources and educate their own children and so on and so forth. All sorts of uh, potentially uh, amazing benefits to birth control. Uh, and, and, we're, and we're both very pro-vasectomy then, right? Like if yes. some guy wants to, okay. Is, I mean, there's no real doubt. I mean, I think once in a while something goes wrong with the surgery, but out, outside of that, it's right. just... I guess the right. issue is just if someone changes their mind or whatever. In which right, case yeah, and so I'm guessing, adopt. yeah, exactly, and I'm guessing that like the best sort of solution in that case would be to bank some up if you mm. and and then yeah, you can always try to get it reversed because I think it can work, but I just I've you know and if I don't, just don't know like what the like how successful it is all the time. Because that's my know. ideal world, is you just have, when guys become sexually <laughs> mature, I, I know that this isn't going to happen, and it's like, it's going to seem like some big brother, like, weird dystopian thing that we could write some science fiction book about, but but the the idea of of males storing their sperm, getting a vasectomy, and then waiting until they actually find the person that they want to have a child with, and then using their stored sperm for that seems like just the that is, perfect that's... solution <laughs> to many of the world's problems. Yeah, no, that's actually like a pretty that's a pretty smart plan, and yeah, it does seem like a weird scene from a dystopian future <laughs> film um, but nonetheless it makes sense right all right so i got you about uh, for about 30 minutes i already know from uh from your work from talking about you and uh and others about the topic in the past that this is a meaty uh super interesting subject uh but i i think that maybe maybe the most pragmatic way to m- make sure that we're getting the most important information out there uh, for people. What would you like to see doctors explain to 
women? Um, so I think that really the most important thing that doctors need to be having a conversation with, with women is just the role that hormones play in coordinating so many different activities in the brain. Um, because I, I don't think that um, most people have really any awareness about what hormones actually are and like what they do and um, you know and, and sex hormones in particular I mean they're part of the signaling machinery that your brain uses to create the experience of being the person that you are and um, you know and so you can't expect that if you take a medication that changes your hormone levels that it's not going to have a fundamental impact on the way that your brain is doing business and this means that it can influence you know all sorts of different aspects of you know yourself and, and who you think of as yourself and so it can influence processes related to hunger and satiety right like so like how hungry you feel or um, how anxious and relaxed you feel who you're attracted to, um, what your levels of sexual desire are, the way that your body regulates mood, you know, the way that your body regulates your sleep schedule. I mean, the hormones touch on all of these different processes. And so I think that just as part of the conversation for going on hormonal contraceptives, you know, I think the first thing that I'd like to see doctors actually explain to patients is like, you know, this is going to influence the activities of your ovaries and prevent pregnancy that way. Um, but in so doing, that's also going to be changing um, the way that your brain does business and um, and the way that you, you know, sort of think, feel and experience the world. Um, and then, you know, sort of maybe if they go going a step further, actually alerting them to the literature, you know, that sort of demonstrates the different ways that um, hormonal birth control can influence these processes. But I, I think that even just like waking people up to the idea that you can't have a localized effect of a hormone um, on a person's, you know, body um, would be a really nice start. Hmm. Do you, is there anything that for any of these things that, that can, um, that, that can help some of these side of, uh, like say, say a doctor's like, hey, this could impact your sleep. One one thing that you could do to offset that is take melatonin at night. Are, are, right. there, are there things like that, um, that, that you know of that can help with any of these issues? Right, I mean, and some of them, I think that even just awareness of them can really go a long way. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, there are some things where you know, just knowing what's going on with me when I'm feeling something can help me get out of it. And just to mm -hmm. give an example of this, which is like the most unflattering female example ever. But, um, you know, when I'm at certain phases of my cycle, I am very angry <laughs> mm -hmm. and moody and, um, and I know it. Um, and just knowing what's going on and recognizing that, no, your life is not terrible. This is just the way that you perceive the world on these like two to three days um, is, is a total game changer for me um, because I recognize it as this is this fleeting thing. Don't make any important decisions. Just try to muscle through. And, um, and that's what I'm able to do. Um, and, and I think that that can be really important, especially when it comes to some of the things that... Um, you know, when it comes to the way that hormonal contraceptives can influence mental health, um, because there is a, a, you know, pretty substantial body of evidence now linking the use of hormonal contraceptives um, to um, an increased risk for things like depression and anxiety. And um, I think that uh, if, you know, you tell your patients that, hey, this is um, associated with an increased risk of um, anxiety and depression, um, keep you know, make note of that, um, that this can at least allow women to have something to reflect on. And if they're not feeling right, they can go and see their doctor about getting something else. Or in this case with the mental health issues, there is, you know, there are some other things that, um, that a, a physician could recommend that could support mental health. Like, um, you know, so what we know from uh, the research literature is that, um, uh, the mental health related issues. So this increased risk of depression and, and anxiety that we see in um, women on hormonal contraceptives, it seems to be driven in large part by a lack of um, GABAergic activity in the brain. 
Um, that's a result of some differences in metabolic processes associated with breaking down normal hormones, so women's natural levels of progesterone um, mm. versus the synthetics. And, um, and you can actually support GABAergic um, activity in your brain. And GABA is a, a calming um, neurotransmitter, so it actually slows down the brain and it makes us feel like we're able to deal with our world and makes things feel more relaxed and um, you can support uh, GABAergic activity by doing things like, um, you know, yoga, meditation, um, different types of relaxation techniques. And so that would be a really nice case where a doctor could actually make recommendations to women um, who are on hormonal contraceptives um, to, you know, to sort of incorporate some of those activities in their, um, in their lives to help promote um, to promote GABAergic activity. So I suppose that, that there's some things like that. Doesn't yeah. alcohol uh, act in the GABA receptors too? It there sure does. Have, it sure have, does. Yeah, yeah it's have funny. Have some wine. Have some wine. Have a, have a Xanax. <laughs> yeah, no. So benzodiazepines and alcohol work on GABA receptors too, right? And that's, yeah. um, and which is, you know, one thing I'm really interested in, and we're actually looking at this in my lab right now, is given that hormonal contraceptives um, decrease GABAergic activity in the brain, it would make really good sense that um, we might expect to see that women who are on the pill um, might be more likely to self-medicate um, for anxiety using alcohol. Um, because, wow. Yeah. Yeah. That, was, that is very important to know. If yeah. That's the case. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Yeah, and so that's something that we're um, we're looking at right now because it would it would really make good sense, you know, that that would be um, an important risk factor for that. So mm. we will see. Um, but yeah, I I have my um, my assistant or whatever she is, she my I don't know we don't have a title for her. I think, <laughs> I think assistant's weird. I think of more of her as a partner, but uh, but she. Um, we were just talking the other day, and she was like, uh, she she was talking about her her cycle and um and and when, and she's like, yeah, I have these these two days. I know when they're going to happen, and I tell my boyfriend Steve to just stay away from me during those two days. I'm like, why don't you ever tell me that? Like we're we're <laughs> working to like you pick your hours. You could just be like, I'm taking those two days off. That could like I <laughs> I wouldn't care. That'd be a that'd be a good uh I'm gonna go on a bender for <laughs> for two I'm gonna get a couple <laughs> bottles of wine, go on a bender for a couple days. Like, oh cool. Thanks for the heads up. That's the other thing too is that like we talked uh, I mean, I mentioned early on with the potential of, of maybe male doctors, this being like an uncomfortable conversation for them to have. I, I was, I was shocked that she hadn't told me this earlier because I'm like, but I'm not, I'm not a traditional boss. We have all sorts of like uh, conversations about awful and appropriate things. Um, <laughs> so, so I was like, why are you, but, but I'm sure, I'm sure that most people with traditional jobs that this is still a thing that that females don't feel that they can express in in the in the typical workplace if if someone if a female that works for me felt uncomfortable talking about her cycle then it must be times 20 in a in a regular job uh, right yeah no absolutely no it would be really in it would be really interesting like to see what that would look like, right? So would that, um, cause I, I would assume that it would, it would I improve productivity, right? Yeah. If it's like, look, I'm going to, I'm going to work extra on these other days and take these two days to just hate my life and, um, yeah. hide in a closet and not, you know, call people terrible really? names. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like I, I think that there could be some real Helps benefits. The whole workplace out. Well, <laughs> seriously, the atmosphere. seriously, like better morale. Like I think there's so much to gain from that. I think it's smart. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Hills advocating bringing back the menstruation tents. Everybody. Yeah, the menstrual you, you, hut. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yep. you heard it here Bring first. The menstrual. You said it, not me. Me uh, bring out the menstrual hut. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, I, I. I uh so which uh, which of the impacts would you say 
are people the most surprised by? Because if I had to guess, I would say it's probably the mate choice stuff. But what when when you're talking with just your average Joe or Jane Schmo at a at a whatever get together, um, what aspect of, of your work are people like blown away by? Yeah, so it's it's there's two. The one is the mate choice, like you talked about, um, mm. and then the other is um, the way that uh, the pill influences the stress response. Um, and so those two things generally really surprise people. Um, well, let's talk about the stress response then, because I want to drive my listeners crazy. <laughs> be like, why? Come on, give us the give us the best one. Yeah, no, the yeah, the mate choice. Yeah, exactly. No, that one's wild and um it's it's so provocative. The um the stress, I'll I'll keep it really short and um and just say that um normally when most of us are feeling stressed out, so if you're giving a speech or you know, you um are falling in love with somebody or it's Christmas morning or you're stuck in traffic, um anything stressful, whether it's a positive or a negative stressor, um generally what happens is um, one of the things that the body does is releases the stress hormone cortisol. And uh, and everybody knows about cortisol. It's the stress hormone. Um, and it tends to get a bad rap just because it's associated with stress. Um, but, str- you know, cortisol doesn't cause stress. Um, you know, life causes stress. Um, and cortisol is part of how our body copes with stress. Um, it, yeah. And so it does things like allows us to, it dumps fat and sugar into our bloodstream. So that way we can make a fast getaway. It, um, it increases uh, our, like births new brain cells in the hippocampus, which is where our brain stores information. And so it improves our memories. So that way we can remember the s- stressful event and does all kinds don't of Don't do this again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, don't do that. Yeah, exactly. Like, remember that time that you did this, <laughs> that a bunch of really bad things happened. Don't do that again. Um, and so, uh, so cortisol is a good thing in the context of stress and, um, but uh, women who are on birth control don't release it. Um, so they've done studies now since the 1990s showing that when um, you stress people out, um, everybody who's a healthy functioning adult releases cortisol um, except for women on hormonal contraceptives. Um, and they have a blunted or completely absent cortisol response. Um, and, their cortis- and, and this is um, something that's kind of alarming um, because this is the type of pattern that we tend to see in people with PTSD or people who've lived through some ter- sort of terrible trauma where the body actually shuts down the stress response um, because it's trying to protect itself from exposure to way too much cortisol. Mm-hmm. And, um, and and so th- this is something that um, a person should not be expecting from their birth control pills, um, given that it's, you know, influencing your, your sex hormones, like the idea that this is also influencing stress hormones in a lot of ways is, um, it sort of illustrates uh, just how wide ranging the effects of these hormonal changes are like throughout the body. Um, but it's also really important because cortisol plays a really important role, not only in terms of um, our memory in the context of stress, which um, there's been research indicating that women who are on the pill have worse memory for emotional events um, due to their lack of cortisol um, uh, in response to stressful situations. Mm. Um, but also it's like, Cortisol is how our, our, is, it helps to regulate our immune system. It um, influences things like our risk for diabetes and our risk for um, heart disease and other things. And so not having normal cortisol patterns is, is weird and, and alarming. And so that's the, that's the, the stress hormone piece. Of, that um, is interesting. What about... Um, it, it, because you mentioned earlier that there's there's sometimes depression that can come along mm-hmm. but I wonder if that's part of the it, because if it's if it's lowering cortisol isn't it sort of just generally numbing it, like aren't you losing a little bit of the richness of life if you're if you're say not uh, as hormonally engaged in uh, normally arousing um, uh, situation and and perhaps that's impacting aspects of depression. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there's there's no question in my mind that um, not having like these dynamic changes in cortisol activity 
um, can be part of what leads to the depression symptomology that we see in the pill takers. Because, you know, one of the things that, you know, one way if you like sort of are thinking about cortisol conceptually, like what it does is it helps us, it helps our bodies and our brains absorb our important experiences, right? right. And so like, like you're absorbing, you know, in, in terms of your brain and everything else, like moments that are meaningful, like whether that meaningful moment is like your wedding day, you know, big cortisol surge, or your life's in danger, big cortisol surge. Um, but having these dynamic changes in cortisol is, is, you know, it's associated with like important events. Right. And the idea of not having these dynamic bursts of cortisol activity in some ways, I think, could almost be this. It's, it's almost like getting a biological signal that nothing important is happening in your environment. Right. Like, like you just live in a totally neutral environment where good things or bad things don't happen. It's just like you're flatlined. And um, yeah, and I have no doubt in my mind that um, that this flattened or blunted or absent cortisol um signaling that we get in uh in the pill takers um that that also in addition to the changes in gabergic activity is also probably associated with some of the mental health problems that we see in women on hormonal contraceptives huh would, would that tend to lower um sex drive as well then potentially because hmm. it would be interesting to take to take this pill so that you can have more sex freely and then right yeah and then well end up <laughs> Yeah, so so it does decrease, like so. Yeah, and and that is um, also one of the the uh, side effects with um, with the pill is um, that it does in a lot of women it, it de decreases um, sexual motivation and in in some women even sexual functioning. So not only do they not really want sex, but when they're having sex, their body isn't responding in the normal ways that women's bodies respond to sexual activity. And, well, I'm um, off the hook for a lot of fail. Of fail. Yeah, <laughs> you're like that was not me. <laughs> yeah. That was not me. That was a pill. That was a pill. Yeah, no. Um, but that's usually, you know, the, the reasons for that. The reason that you get those patterns of results is because of um, what happens with uh, testosterone. So one thing that we know about birth control pills is that they increase. And the release of what's known as sex hormone binding globulins and those like bind up your testosterone and make it unusable to your body mm. and pill takers have like much higher levels of the they're called uh, uh shbgs so sex hormone binding globulins they have much higher levels of these and they have much less usable tea and so that's one of the big reasons that you get reduced sexual functioning in women and the other one is just that when you're suppressing um, ovulation and you're suppressing um, sort of ovarian, you know, uh, maturation of um, of egg follicles. Um, you're suppressing estrogen, and that's the other thing that really fuels female sexual response. And so, when you keep both um, estrogen and um, testosterone really low, that's sort of like a recipe for lack of sexual desire. And so, you know, one mechanism by which uh, hormonal contraceptives um, work, right, in addition to suppressing <laughs> ovulation, is also yeah, suppressing of uh, sexual behavior. Huh. All the more reason to get a vasectomy if you're all the more this reason. Is, this. <laughs> um, well, it, what about this? So, you're you're so I, I know your husband has a vasectomy from your book, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, but uh, what, what about if you? If you just want to lower your stress, you're you're going to visit family. You're having you're having to <laughs> to travel. Well, while traveling, you got to give an important speech via Zoom in the car with your and your kids are there who you're now falling in love with for the first time because they're now teenagers. And this is this and and you're anticipating this incredibly stressful situation could you take birth control as like uh to suppress your your cortisol levels well, yeah except i don't think that that's actually going to make you feel any better it's just going to make you feel no. worse cuz yeah you're not going to be able to like cope with the stress and so I you're going to get the double whammy of being stressed out and then not being able to do anything like your body isn't going to be able to respond in a meaningful way to it so cuz my my more serious <laughs> related thought was uh, there there are arguments um made that that we that that uh, the modern human is potentially unnecessarily 
chronically stressed due to um you know mismatches in the threat sonar environment and something like traffic not being the actual threat that uh, uh that are uh our our bodies inappropriately overly responding to something that in reality isn't an actual uh threat so if, so so there wouldn't be an argument to be made that 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 this or something like it in the future could be some something to offset that mismatch in in our in our modern world so so that's like that's interesting right so if you were to take a um corticosteroid binding globulin right or something that acts like that so basically makes your cortisol unusable by the body like, would that be sort of therapeutic to use uh, in like these stressor, like these stressful situations that really shouldn't be stressful, like traffic, right? Where it's like, we're not being helped by any way having our stress response going off in traffic every day. And all that it does is um, mess things up. And um, yeah, I don't know, like, if you were to actually get something that was really short lived, right, it could potentially be it could potentially be beneficial. Amazing. Well, I just discovered a new thing and uh, <laughs> getting to work on it. Exactly. Uh, um, <laughs> one, of, one of my many uh, scientific breakthroughs. Right, exactly. Um, I, I, uh, well, that will be interesting if we, like Viagra came out of searching for a heart medication. Maybe, maybe uh, we'll figure out some some protective uh, uh, um, cardiovascular thing or stress right. reductive thing through uh, trying to um, uh, better birth control. Right, exactly. Uh, well, we better we better make sure and get into the mate selection stuff. I know uh, this is we've we've talked about it some on the show before. It's been a while, and uh, and it, it, even if we've t talked about these similar subjects, one I guarantee there will be a few new things that people have learned. Even if you listen to every episode four times over and take notes and remember everything and two it's always fun to hear uh hear things phrased in a in a new way so why don't you break those um some of those impacts down for us some of those effects sure so the, this um research is actually based on um, some research that's been going on now for about 20 years um, that has demonstrated the effects of um, women's cyclic or cyclically changing sex hormones on their preferences for men. And um, what this research shows is that when the sex hormone estrogen um, is dominant, um, which is generally what happens with naturally cycling women, so women who are not on the pill, um, you know, right prior to ovulation, and then, um, you know, at ovulation. So early on in the cycle, women's levels of estrogen are relatively high. And because this is a period of time that's associated with the ability to conceive, um, researchers have proposed that estrogen levels should predict not only women's interest in um, sex sort of generally and their desire for sex, um, but should also influence the types of qualities that they emphasize in their choice of partners. Um, and in particular, um, this research predicts that um, when estrogen levels are high, that it should increase women's preference for men who have cues associated with um, the with uh, testosterone. And the reason for this is that testosterone is sort of a hypothesized uh, good genes marker. Um, so it's something that um, is associated because it is an immunosuppressive and it's metabolically costly. Um, the idea is that only men who have sort of low mutation loads um, and who have relatively um, robust immune systems um, will be able to produce um, relatively high levels of testosterone. And so it's believed to be an indicator of things like health and developmental stability and other things that in the evolutionary world we just like call having good genes. And so, um, and there's been a lot of research supporting this general idea that at high fertility or during times in the menstrual cycle, when estrogen is high, so right near ovulation, um, and you know, five or so days prior, so usually like days seven to 12 in the cycle, um, women express um, and exhibit a greater preference for facial masculinity, 
um, the scent of men who are have higher levels of testosterone, um, you know, faces and voices, and um, and even the gait of men who have higher levels of testosterone. Um, and so, so this research has been going on for for quite some time now. I um, mean, it's 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 received a pretty fair amount of evidence. Um, more recently, researchers then asked themselves, you know, well, given that uh, women um, have this greater preference for testosterone markers when estrogen is the dominant sex hormone, um, what happens when you have women on hormonal contraceptives when their estrogen levels are kept really low? Um, because you're suppressing um, egg maturation, which then in turn suppresses estrogen levels. Um, and so what the prediction was is that if we look at the mate preferences of women who are naturally cycling and then compare them to the mate preferences of women who are on hormonal birth control, that we should expect to see that the natural cyclers have a preference for on average more you know sort of masculine male faces and males who possess more testosterone markers than what we should see among women who are on hormonal contraceptives. Um, and this um, hypothesis has been pretty well supported by the research and the research seems to indicate that not only do women who are on birth control um, desire uh, less masculine male faces, but they also seem to be choosing these men as their partners. Um, so for example, in one study, they um, collected a large sample of partnered men, right? So men who were in relationships, they took photographs of the men, and then they had the men indicate whether or not they had um, been chosen by their partner um, when they were on or off of hormonal birth control. Um, and what they found was that when they divided up the, the men and placed the photographs of the men that were chosen by women when they were on hormonal birth control in one pile, and then took the photographs of the men who were chosen by the naturally cycling women and put them in another pile um, and then had them all evaluated on things like masculinity um, and using both subjective measures. So people looking at the photographs and evaluating how masculine is this guy, um, but also using computer programs, computer algorithms that are able to detect certain types of things like facial width to height and some other things that are associated with um, testosterone presence. And what they find is that, um, is that uh, the, the men who were chosen as partners by the pill takers had less masculine faces than did the men who were chosen by the natural cyclers. And so all of this stuff seems to indicate that, um, you know, that uh, hormonal contraceptive use um, can influence um, the types of qualities that women are really prioritizing in their choice of partners with um, women who are naturally cycling, emphasizing cues associated with testosterone presence and sort of sexiness, um, and women who are on hormonal birth control focusing on other things. And what the research seems to show um, is that the types of qualities that women who are on hormonal birth control, the types of qualities that they're focusing on in their partner choice tends to be things like financial security, um, and a person's sort of capacity for um, investment in children, right? And so you get these like very different sets of priorities um, among the pill takers and the natural cyclers. Um, and of course, this is really provocative because people don't like choose their partner and then stay on hormonal contraceptives forever or stay off of hormonal contraceptives forever. And so this, of course, raises the possibility that there could end up being mismatches that develop if a person chooses their partner when they were on the pill and then they go off of it, or if they choose their partner when they're off the pill and then go on it. Um, and there's some evidence that seems to suggest that this can cause some um, sort of shakeups within the context of, of romantic relationships. <laughs> That is uh, that is so uh, uh, fantastic. I I love thinking about that. So so should ladies potentially, uh, uh, in an ideal world, you you would you would find a guy and and be both on and off the pill at, at certain intervals to be like, do I still? Like Do this I still guy? like this guy? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that, you know, I think like if there's one bit of sort of takeaway advice from, from all that research, it would be this. And that is um, for women who do not need to be on hormonal contraceptives, um, like if you're just on them because you were on, you were in a relationship last month and you're not in one anymore um, and you're just like on them because you're on them. Um, and you're looking for a partner, I mean, my recommendation would be that, um, you know, take a break, take a break mm -hmm. from your pills for a little while. 
Um, if you don't need to be on it, don't be on it. Um, and especially if you're going to be looking for a partner, because you're going to spend more of your life probably not being on hormonal contraceptives than you are going to be spending on them. And so you may as well have like sort of the version of yourself that you are when you're not on the pill be the version that's choosing your partner um, if possible. And of course, this isn't always possible for women. And, you know, the the evidence is still like it, it's probably not going to be influencing um, all women's relationships and in, you know, really dramatic ways. But it is, like I said, it is really provocative and it's something to keep in mind um, if you're a woman and you're trying to strategize your use of the birth control pill in ways that makes, you know, sense to use it when it makes sense to use it and then not to use it or take a break from it during times when, you know, it might just be better off to have your own hormones doing their thing. Hmm. I wonder if I'm an on or off or what do you think? You should have that on, you should have that, uh, you should have like a thing on, on uh, a site or something like that, 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 that tells guys. I tells love guys. this. I love it. And I think, I think Shane, I think you need to have like an Instagram poll and have a photograph of yourself and, um, well, and ask people, the, do you the, think, the, am I your birth control boyfriend or am I your naturally cycling boyfriend? I think that's perfect. I, I mean, the the beard's definitely leaning toward uh, off birth control, but mm -hmm. uh, it's not so much. I, I mean, I'm not like balding. I clearly don't have that much testosterone. I, I don't know. I think I, I yeah, it's tough to say. In science, we always say that's an empirical question <laughs> when we don't know the answer. So I think that's an empirical question. I think we need to pop your face onto Instagram and um, and that take a poll just... and say, is Shane an on or off pill guy? I'm going to do that when this episode comes yeah. out. That's such a fantastic idea. I, know, I think uh... it's fantastic. And I think people will think it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, everybody, please get Sarah Hill's book, This Is Your Brain on Birth Control. It's fantastic. You just heard how interesting all of this stuff is, and you just heard the tiniest little sliver and it only gets more interesting when you when you get more of the details and the ins and outs and the many 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 things that we didn't even come close to barely touching on so make sure and get once again this is your brain on birth control thank you very much sarah hill lovely to see you again yeah it's so good to see you too with your in your bearded glory <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I I hope that you have a wonderful uh, holidays. All all kidding aside, and uh, with, with with your with your newly liked children, and uh, yes. uh, <laughs> and I hope to maybe see you next year under better situations. Yeah, yeah. In maybe person. we'll maybe the clubs will be open again, and the, yeah. the world will be <laughs> who knows saved. Who knows. Um, and I want to thank you listeners, of course, as usual, for being such wonderful, curious people. Uh, those of you that care about this kind of stuff, I, I have no idea why everybody doesn't, but, uh, but those of you that do are the finest humans around, in my opinion. I hope you got a lot out of this, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>